The final tool economists use to predict recessions is the yield curve or the treasury spread. So the yield curve shows the interest rates for bonds on the vertical axis with different maturity rates on the horizontal axis. So just to give you a quick idea about bonds, we're going to go ahead and take a look at bonds in chapter number 11 and 12, just a little bit more in depth. But bonds are essentially a form of debt. It's an IOU. And you can go ahead to any corporation or to any firm or even the government in order to purchase a portion of their debt. So if the government, if corporations need money, they can issue bonds and you yourself can go ahead and buy these bonds. It's actually a very, very nice financial asset for you guys to go ahead and hold if you need some type of return on your money. So in terms of bonds themselves, in terms of the yield curve, the interest or the return for you on holding the bond is going to be known as the yield right here. So here, the higher the yield, the more return that you're going to get. However, attached to every single bond that you're going to go ahead and hold for a financial asset is also going to be tied to some type of maturity. And maturity just tells us exactly that. How long is this bond going to last? So there can be very, very short bonds. They can last you one week. They can last you one year, one month. Or they can be very, very long bonds, long maturity bonds. They can be three years, five years, 10 years, 30 years. So here, in terms of bonds, we're going to be taking a look at the yield and maturity for United States bonds, so government bonds, the treasuries, as they sort of call them, T-bills. And what type of relationship do you see between the yield and maturity for bonds for U.S. Treasury bills? You notice that as the maturity goes up, that yield is also going to go up as well. So for short maturity bonds, the yield is relatively low. But for long maturity bonds, the yield is relatively high. And this does make sense. For short maturity bonds, say maybe a one-year maturity uh, bond, we can say that, hey, you're only locking away your money for one year. So here you're going to get some type of return for that. And that return is going to be fairly low. However, if you have, say, a 30-year mature, uh, maturity bond, that tells us that you're locking your, way, your money for 30 years, and so you need to be compensated for that. So in this instance, the yield has to be higher. So typically, longer maturity bonds do have higher yields or higher returns than shorter maturity bonds. So these are a few things that we want to go ahead and make a note of in order to build up the treasury spread. First, we do want to notice that the yield is the interest rate is the interest rate on a bond, is the interest rate on a bond. So here, yield is just a really fancy way of saying, what is the interest rate or return that you get on a particular bond? The higher the yield, the more return that you're gonna get. And as we did notice with the yield curve, there should be a positive relationship between the maturity and yield. So here, longer maturity bonds, longer maturity bonds, have higher yields than shorter maturity bonds. Have higher yields than shorter maturity bonds. Than shorter maturity bonds. Maturity bonds. So here, longer maturity bonds have higher yields than shorter maturity bonds. So the longer you're locking your money away from, the higher the yield should be. That's just according to the relationship that we saw in terms of the yield curve. So when we take this into mind, when we assume that this is going to happen, when we take the difference between the yield on the long maturity bonds and the short maturity bonds, the yield on the short maturity bonds, what should that difference be? Should it be positive or should it be negative? So essentially what we're doing is we're subtracting the yield on the longer maturity bonds and we subtract out the yield on the shorter maturity bonds. In this instance, we should note that this difference is going to be positive. So in normal situations, in normal situations, in normal situations, the difference between the difference between long maturity yield, long maturity yield, and short maturity yield, short maturity yield is positive, is positive. So in normal situations, we notice that the difference between long maturity yield and short maturity yield should be positive. So remember, the long maturity yield, it's giving you a very high yield, but the short maturity yield is going to give you a very low interest rate. So taking the difference between these two numbers, that number, that difference should be positive. And this is going to happen in 
normal economic situations when things are running fairly normally. However, what do you think is going to expect to happen when this difference actually becomes negative? Where the yields on long maturity bonds actually give you less than the yields on short maturity bonds. Essentially, when this happens, when that difference becomes negative and the yield curve is going to invert, so essentially here, we have the curve going to be sort of a mirror image right here. So if you wanted to draw this out, the yield curve would now look like a mirror image of that. So something along this line right here, where the longer maturity, where the shorter maturity, or the shorter maturity bonds, excuse me, are going to give you a higher yield than the longer maturity yield. So something along the lines like this. So here it almost looks like a C if you wanted to build that up. And when this is going to happen, we're going to go ahead and notice that the yield curve has inverted. We're going to have a negative treasury spread. And that's actually a very reliable way of predicting when recessions might happen. So here we have the treasury spread. So what we're doing is taking the difference on a 10-year treasury bond and a two-month treasury bond in this graph right here. And we do notice that, hey, this is the difference right here. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. And we notice that these are when recessions happen. So here we have the last eight recessions. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The eight past financial uh, or recessions that have happened within the economy. And what do we notice every time period in the period leading up to a recession. In the vast majority of these cases, we notice that the treasury spread turns negative. It turns negative right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So out of the past seven out of the eight recessions, we see the treasury spread actually turning negative, and then the time period that followed after that, a recession actually did happen. The only time that didn't happen is this first recession that we see right here. It only became very, very close to zero, but that's still pretty close. That's still a pretty good indicator of predicting recessions itself. So here, this is the tool that most economists use nowadays in order to predict recessions because as you can see out of the past eight recessions it successfully predicted it out seven out of the eight times so as you can see right here when short-term interest rates exceed long-term rates the treasury spread turns negative which has been a reliable predictor of a pending recession and the last time our treasury spread turned negative was in november of 2019 so if we actually carry this out if we did the data for this a little bit longer we'd actually see the Treasury spread turned negative, surpassed a zero threshold right here. And in the time period after that, this is exactly where we see the recession that sort of bounced from the COVID-19 sort of epidemic and see exactly what happens in terms of that time period. Although this is a very reliable predictor, it is not 100% accurate, so you do want to be aware of that. In any economic model that we have, it's not going to tell you exactly what happens to a T in reality, remember, there is a lot of variables that need to come into play, but we do leave out a lot of variables. But in terms of predicting recessions, we have the treasury spread with the yield curve, we have the leading economic index, and we also have the national activity index. So three tools that economists use in combination with one another in order to predict when bad times might happen for any economy. So hopefully this was a little bit more relevant. And hopefully this was a little bit relevant given the situations that we find ourselves in over the past few months and years. So go ahead and use this for your own advantage and knowledge.